Three, two, one. All right. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Good evening, wherever you're coming to us from around the world. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, it's our new format for the annual Lowell Lecture Series, Climate Change in Boston, a Historical Perspective, brought to you by the Paul Revere Memorial Association in partnership this year with Revolutionary Spaces and Boston's Green Ribbon Commission. So we'll be with you for the next three Tuesday nights um, as we kind of work through different periods of time in climate change history in Boston. My name is Robert Shump, and I will give a little bit more of an introduction in, in just a minute. But for now, I will toss over to our executive director, Nina Zanieri, who will have a few more um, formal, less formal, we'll, we'll find out, <laughs> remarks to uh, kick off our, our lecture series this year. Nina? Well, thank you, Robert. Um, I want to add my welcome and uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. We're really happy to be kicking off this series. And I just want to say a couple words about the Green Ribbon Commission, because a couple years ago, I think it was maybe two years ago, I started attending their meetings and I was very taken by their approach with something I hadn't really thought about. Their thought was that cultural institutions through programming and messaging have an important role to play in climate awareness. And I hadn't thought of our institution in that role before. It made me think that history organizations have a particular responsibility to provide a thoughtful perspective on historical climate over time. And we thought that looking at that in both Boston and New England would be instructive and might add to the discussion. So with that germ of an idea and in Robert's capable hands, it turned into this series that you're gonna attend. And we're really pleased that our friends at the Lowell Institute said, we wanna fund you virtual, in-person, in hybrid, however you do it, we're there. I also know that this continues to be a very difficult year for the cultural sector. So I encourage you to consider that if you have a cultural institution that you love or that you visited often and has changed your life in some way and that brings you joy and enriches your life, or if you'd like to help a cultural institution you know be more responsive to climate change, now would be a great time to make a contribution that will help them be more financially sustainable and also more environmentally resilient. So with that, um, I'm looking forward to hearing tonight's talk and have a good evening. Great, thank you so much, Nina. So in focusing on, on where we're at tonight then, um, I want to offer a bit of an introduction here for our, our brilliant speaker that we have tonight, Anya Zilberstein. Um, I'll give an introduction here just so everyone can, as a format of, of the night, uh, Professor Zilberstein will um, give her talk and then we will be able to open it up virtually to questions at the end. So stick around. We have um, a few of our colleagues monitoring questions coming in on whatever format that, that you're um, viewing us on tonight. So we will try to get to as many of your questions as we can as the, uh, as the night goes on. So again, thank you so much for coming out tonight um, for our inaugural, inaugural um, virtual Lowell Lecture Series, again, made possible by the continued support and generous funding from the Lowell Institute. Um, as Nina mentioned, um, I am the Research and Adult Program Director for the Paul Revere Memorial Association. Um, we're, again, really glad that you can join us here. I think that's, as we're finding one of the silver linings of, of this entire situation is that we've been able to expand some of the programming that, that we've done, obviously, in person the last few years at Old South Meeting House, but we're really excited to, to be able to expand this and, and bring this content to you where, wherever you are in, in the country or in the world as well. Um, as we've said, this year's theme is climate change in, in Boston. And just to, to reiterate Nina's points as well, um, I, I started this position back in early 2019. And this is one of the first conversations that, that Nina and I had about programming was looking ahead to 2020 and this lecture series. So this is something that, that um, you know, we've given a, a lot of thought to over time. And we're, we're really excited to, to be able to open the, the, the programming tonight. As you can tell, tonight's talk is by Professor Anya Zilberstein, 
and it's entitled Global Warming and Global Cooling in Early Boston, a very fitting kickoff to this program, which is going to take us through uh, a few different time periods. We'll look more into the, the 19th century in Boston next week, and then we'll close with a panel discussion on September 29th that takes a more contemporary view uh, of climate change in Boston. Professor Zilberstein is an associate professor of history at Concordia University in Montreal, where she's been part of the department since 2007. She received her PhD in 2008 from MIT. Uh, she's the author of A Temperate Empire, Making Climate Change in Early America, uh, which won the Berkshire Conference of Women Historians Book Prize in 2016. Uh, she also won the Sophie Co. Essay Prize as part of the Oxford Symposium on Food History. A uh, few of her many uh, recent grants have included the Insight Development Grant for the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, uh, Franklin Research Grant from the American Philosophical Society and the Georgian Papers Program Fellowship. Uh, other publications include A Considerable Change of Climate, Glacial Retreat and British Policy in Early 19th Century Arctic. And we might have to get some questions about this one too at the end, uh, Bastard Breadfruit and other cheap provisions, early food science for the welfare of the lower orders. Uh, she's currently working on research in the history of climate science, food sciences in the British Empire, history of ornithology, and the history of migration and race. A uh, tentative uh, title for one of the projects coming up is Fodder for Empire, Feeding People Like Other Animals. And I would also add she's co-editor of the new Routledge book series, New Slash Old Nature's Histories of the Environment. We are thrilled to have her on board this evening. Um, again, stick around. If you have questions at the end, we will get to them um, as, as, as many as we can in the time that we have here. So as you are ready, Anya, feel free to take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, and it, everyone, can, you can hear me? The sound is on. Okay, excellent. Uh, so I'll start just by thanking Robert Chimp and Emily Holmes in particular for helping coordinate this talk and for the invitation from the Paul Revere Memorial Association, as well as uh, the Lowell Institute and Greenways for sponsoring, um, uh, for, sponsor, for inviting and for sponsoring this talk. Uh, because this is my first, not my first time on Zoom, as <laughs> all of us have had more and more experience on it, but certainly my first time giving a talk, there are a couple of technical glitches uh, that may arise. And so I'm just, uh, you know, apologies in advance, in advance of that. I'll, uh, I'll try to work with my screen uh, rather than with you as an audience um, as well as I can. Um, I thought I just wanted to note that I actually grew up in Brookline and lived in Massachusetts for a good part of my life before I moved to Montreal. So it was too bad that I couldn't um, give the talk in the Old South Meeting House, as most of these lecture series uh, are are often offered. Um, on the other hand, uh, in the other room, I have a very very young infant. Uh, so I wouldn't have been able to do that talk uh, no matter what else was happening in the world. Um, so double, triple thanks um, for, for hosting me tonight. So uh, one of the glitches, as you'll see, is that I can't show my slideshow myself. So I'll be directing Robert to, to put up the slides. Um, so slide. Okay, so uh, I'll assume that, well, I, I can't see the slides that are up on the on the YouTube live, Robert. So could, just before I begin talking, can we, can I have some verification that, we, okay, great, excellent. Um, so you could forward one slide. Okay, so as as you may have picked up from Robert's kind introduction um, of me of me and my work, I've moved um, somewhat on to working on other topics in the environmental history of early America and more broadly um, the early British Empire, uh, specifically focusing on food. But but given the topic of of your series, Robert asked me to talk about my book, and that's mainly what I'm going to do. Uh, my book, uh, as he mentioned, A Tempered Empire, Making Climate Change in Early America. I'll give you just sort of a taste of the, the broad outlines of, of that book this evening. And slide. Uh, I thought I would start by the in the way that I start the book um, with a story 
from uh, Samuel Williams, who was who had the title of Reverend, but was actually trained at Harvard by John Winthrop in what at the time was called natural history and the sciences, and succeeded his professor uh, Winthrop in at to, in becoming the Hollis Professor of Mathematics and Natural Philosophy, uh, a natural history and sciences professor at Harvard in 1780. Um, Williams was an interesting character, uh, but he also was probably one of the most prolific proponents of the kind of discussions of climate change that I'm, that I'm gonna talk the most about in the next half hour or so. Um, he, uh, in 1780, he became uh, a, pro a professor at Harvard and actually in the same year, I thought I could mention, he, um, he was one of the founders of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in Cambridge course, is still um, an important cultural institution there, um, which at the time was at the center of many discussions about scientific matters, broadly speaking, and that included a uh, really pervasive interest in um, ideas and theories about climate and climate change, uh, as you'll see. And part of the reason why I mentioned that is because I thought I might be able to make some connection between Paul Revere and the people that I write about in the book, like Williams. Um, and one probable connection would be that, of course, among the other founders of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences were people like John and Sam Adams, uh, with whom Revere was um, closely associated. And so I have no doubt, although I haven't done research in particular on him and his papers, and have no idea whether or not he ever recorded his opinion about these kinds of discussions that were contemporary to him and his um, friends and associates, I have no doubt that he himself, Revere, was aware of, of the kinds of um, uh, models of climate change or um, arguments that were circulating uh, simply, uh, argu arguments that were circulating at the same, at the same time. Uh, so slide, next slide. I would have done this more seamlessly on my own, but um, you can just forward to the to the fourth slide with this manuscript on it. Uh, so this manuscript uh, was is in the hand of Samuel Williams. It's located in the Harvard University Archives in their faculty um, archives, the collection of, of papers from from former faculty at Harvard, um, and archivists there have estimated that it was probably drafted sometime in the 1770s, although previously, and in my book, um, it was estimated that it was um, probably from, this, from the late 1780s. But it's interesting that it was even earlier than I thought that it was. It's a manuscript that, as you can see at the top, uh, was titled Change of Climate in North America. And in it, um, although this was just a, a handwritten um, piece that Williams um, may or may not have circulated uh, beyond himself, uh, in which uh, which later appear, I mean, text of which later appeared in, in publications that, um, that were widely read. Uh, in any case, what Change of Climate in North America describes is the ways in which over the past 150 years from the 1770s or so, back from the 1770s, colonists in um, British North America and elsewhere in the Americas, he implied, I had physically changed the atmosphere um, of the regions where they had settled. Uh, and he goes into great detail and harnesses data of really every kind that he had access to in this period in the 1770s in order to prove his point that he believed um, in Boston specifically and in New England generally, the climate had become milder, both somewhat warmer uh, in the winters and, um, and less humid in the summers than it had been when it was first settled by his teacher, John Winthrop's great, great, great grandfather in the 1630s. That both anecdotal evidence, that is, you know, um, discussions with old, older residents in, um, in Boston and beyond, in Vermont, in Connecticut, where he traveled, uh, in which conversations in which elderly people describe the much more severe uh, conditions of their childhoods compared to now, the sort of a in my day uh, testimony, uh, 
uh, as well as his own empirical data that he gathered, for example, taking a thermometer and plunging it into the ground wherever he traveled in the Connecticut River Valley in uh, what be later became the state of Maine in southern Massachusetts and comparing the temperatures across the region and also incorporating long-standing theories, which I'll describe in a moment, collating all of this evidence, everything that he has access to, and, um, and claiming that the, the temperature and the conditions of the climate had materially changed and in fact warmed um, in the region uh, over, over almost two centuries. Slide. Um, and here's a, a, just a tidbit from this manuscript that summarizes, um, summarizes the grand kind of conclusion that he comes to. Slide. The whole earth, he wrote, is less subject to extreme cold than it was formerly. Slide. And every climate has become more temperate and uniform and equal, and that this would continue to be the case until uh, uh, as long as essentially kind of um, industrious, um, hardworking folks continued to cultivate the land um, as they were, as they had been in the 17th and through the 18th centuries, that climates might be maintained in this temperate state um, as, as long as people conducted themselves in, in the correct way. So although in the manuscript, to some extent, he focused on uh, New England, and then in a later publication, he focused especially on Vermont and the climatic changes that had come to it, uh, really had a much bigger ambition to, to integrate the history of climatic shifts that he either witnessed or felt that he had evidence for in New England was part of a much broader universal global history. This was his bigger ambition. Um, so on the one hand, uh, and I've been tasked to talk about Boston and New England, Samuel Williams was focused on this local evidence. On the other hand, he believed that there was that this was simply an instance of a process that was happening in a, a much wider range of, of um, places all around the world. Uh, slide. Uh, so in my book, one of the things that I do in starting with this story is to, um, there's a bit of shock value in it, I think, for um, even for historians who have never really thought about climate as an explicit part of 17th and 18th century or, you know, colonial American, early American um, ideas. Uh, but certainly for anyone and I'm not sure how many uh, of these readers exist beyond my own family who usually stop after the first few pages once they realize it's a very academic book. Um, but, but the shock value of, of realizing that these conversations about global warming or climate change, uh, awareness of it, and even sort of the belief that it's occurring have a much, much longer trajectory, have a much longer history than is usually acknowledged. I mean, usually the focus is on uh, at the very, you know, late, you know, the very earliest where you'll end up in the third part of the series, which is in the 20th century. Um, but to go back further and further back just seems to be um, anachronistic and or pointless. Uh, so I hope I'll, by giving you just a, a taste of, of uh, what were really wide ranging and very, very engaged interest in uh, thinking about climate in the 1700s that I discuss in my book, I'll at the very least this evening convince you that that there's a much longer history, there's a much longer tradition, if you will, or culture of thinking about climate. Um, and one that was uh, particularly um, important, significant, um, present in, in, in Boston and in New England in the, in the 1700s and beyond. Um, so in this book, and the reason why I highlighted this piece of the quote in the slide, every climate has become more temperate, is that part of the, the at the center of my argument is that in some ways, as I think you'll see, ideas and discussions about climate in the 1700s have echoes in, uh, in the future, in the 20th century, and even today, in terms of thinking about global warming and its, its causes as well as its implications. On the other hand, uh, there are ways in which, of course, you know, it, it's very particular to its period. Uh, in colonial America and into the late, into the post-revolutionary period and early 19th century, one of the kind of core 
interests of those people talking about climate, whether they were scientists like Samuel Williams or um, educated um, friends and associates of his in, um, in, in uh, cities across, uh, across New England and across early America, uh, was that people were very interested in uh, inhabiting, maintaining, or creating temperate, moderate climates, living in places that essentially that were comfortable, uh, according to uh, European or colonial European definitions of comfort. So temperateness, as as you'll see, and as the title of my book implied, um, is is one of the sort of the cardinal um, principles of of at least aspirations for the kinds of climates that people are not just interested in studying but interested in living living in. Uh, temperateness. Uh, slide. Slide. Um, and that. It, that focus on temper, temperateness, on moderation, on on sort of even seasons, having a winters winters and summers that were neither too long nor nor too short, depending on the kind of economic activities that were happening in a particular place, nor too cold uh, and dry or hot and humid, um, having kind of equal seasons with uh, mild temperatures, but warm enough in order to grow a whole variety of of, of edible or otherwise useful plants to be hospitable to a whole variety of different kinds of animals. Um, that ideal informs the immigrants to the colonies over the course of the entire um, period of early American history. And, um, and it threatens the livelihoods or the um, bottom lines, if you will, of those who come to own uh, uh, Occupy land or own large tracts of lands in places like New England, or further south um, in South Carolina or Georgia, where temperateness is not exactly the experience of of newcomers, um, to uh, and, and and therefore threatens the 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 sort of to undermine the the stability of the colonies. So um, let's go to the next slide. So I just wanted to note that um, there, there certainly were uh, books published and discussions recorded of the, the character of the local climate as localized as in a particular place like Boston, a particular um, port town or city like Boston. However, usually the natural history or descriptions of places like any micro locality like Boston were of course wrapped up, up into broader uh, discussions of, the, of a region, uh, whether a colonial region or uh, places that seem to have continuous, um, to be, that, that could be characterized in terms of continuous environmental um, features. And usually uh, discussions about Boston were obviously wrapped up into uh, discussions of New England, especially Southern New England in the 17th century um, and edging into the 18th century into uh, more northerly parts of New England, but they even included places further north uh, that are now considered the Canadian Maritime Provinces, Nova Scotia in principally because it was the most, um, uh, it was settled, it was conquered and settled the longest by European colonists, French and Scots and, and English um, colonists. And so um, again, in my book, I basically treat New England as greater New England encompassing Nova Scotia um, as well. So even more severe conditions than were found in, in, in New England. And, um, and uh, oh, you'll see in a moment why, why that, that, um, was, that was important. Uh, so what I'd like to do very, very briefly in, the, um, in, in this talk is first, explain a little bit about sort of what informed 18th century, uh, 17th and but also 18th century ideas about temperateness, about why this ideal was so, um, was so important to, um, to people, um, to European colonists and their, and their descendants living in, in Boston and New England in this period, um, and the, the, the ancient roots of, of those ideas. Um, then I, I'll, briefly talk about the sort of the three, what I see as the three main strands of discussions about climate 
um, in this period, and particularly reactions, because this is what generated the most discussion about climate in the early period, reactions to those who described the New England, the greater New England climate as much less desirable than was first expected uh, of it. And, um, um, and the ways in which, you know, the, uh, the descriptions of New, New England's winter in particular came to really bear down upon uh, 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 notions of and images of what the region was like, what the weather was like. And then um, finally, I'll really focus on one of those three strands, the one that I began with, and that is uh, of cli uh, about climate change. So slide, please, next slide. So I mentioned that ideas about climate that um, underlay discussions of climate in the colonial period um, had very ancient roots in Roman and Greek writings um, from antiquity. Um, and in fact, the only maps that I have found and that I'm aware of, having done a considerable amount of research or, or that I've seen um, in other people's uh, re public, published research on the topic, the only actual vis visual representations that we have um, of ideas about climate in the 18th century are all variations. They're derived from uh, ancient models, um, ancient visions of the, of the climates and the climate zones of the world. So um, of, uh, of, an, of, an, of this ancient zonal map of the world, climate zonal, zonal map, and actually, it should be pretty familiar, even though it's very schematic and it, the spelling is um, antiquated. It's it, it still is a, a sort of um, schematic vision that that many people probably have if they ever were to think of, you know, what are the how is the how are the climates of the world divided? What's the simplest way of talking about it? Well, the simplest way, of course, is to think about the extremes, which is the poles, the frozen zones, as they're as they're marked on the 16th century publication um, image of the earth as a circle. The frozen zones are the, are the polar and Antarctic circles and the equator in the middle. And from the equator, you then have above the Tropic of Can uh, uh, Cancer and below the Tropic of Capricorn, two different temperate zones. Um, so this is actually a guide for, for um, mariners that's published in the late 16th century and then republished later on. Um, but it has a section on what is a climate, um, which is useful probably for navigation, but also for generally understanding where a European sailor might end up in terms of the environmental conditions on the other side of the Atlantic, that, or the, that ocean that comes to be called the Atlantic in the Americas, where Europeans, of course, have no idea about the actual conditions of climate, but they use these ancient models for thinking about what they might predict to be the conditions on the other side of the ocean after 1492, of course, when, when Europeans come to be aware um, late, very late in history that there are uh, their, their entire continents on the other side of the ocean. Slide. Um, and here's just another rendering. This is a 12th century map, of course, but that gives you a, a sort of a more colorful visual um, image with almost no text. Um, of these zones and the blue zone, the red zone is the is the equator, which in some writings from the from the early modern period uh, would describe as uninhabitable. Then everything beyond the, the far below North Africa is simply too hot um, to be habitable. And about the southern uh, region, southern latitudes, Europeans had relatively little information, so they focused on the top uh, uh, belt of that blue line of the temperate world. This they believed to be the habitable world, which they, by which they meant the world that you would want to inhabit. Um, slide. And here, just to make that more graphic, talking about those blue zones. Um, slide. And there they are again. Slide. Okay, so from a different kind of map from the early 17th century, getting into the period of historical um, time when maps of the Americas, European maps of, of the Americas, but at least of the coasts of the Americas started to become a bit more detailed and looking uh, 
somewhat more, uh, you know, closely resembling uh, what the coast might have looked like, if not the interior. Um, what the, those zonal maps uh, provided and then became more detailed, of course, into the um, post-Renaissance period and beyond, when map making became a, a much more vigorous uh, sort of focus of, of activity, at least in Europe and the colonial Americas, um, is that the lines of latitude that predicted um, where the zones began and end, ended across the world um, came to also be the main way in which uh, cli climatic conditions might be predicted in new places, so slide. So the uh, what most European travelers to the Americas believed was that if you simply followed lines of latitude, you would find the same climates. And you can find this in any anyone who has written about climate or environment in the early America, they have to pay some attention to talking about this factor, which is that the British Isles are much farther north than most people really often expect them to be, because people know that London has a relatively milder climate than um, most of New England, despite the fact that actually, if you look at lati uh, latitudinal maps, New England is much further south. And you can sort of see this. I've drawn in um, green and blue the lines of latitude uh, slide. And um, these latitudinal um, equivalences, uh, which would, should have suggested that, that Newfoundland, for example, in the previous slide, would have had conditions very similar to Southern England um, at the latitude of London, which we know, of course, not to be true, also suggested that New England um, itself was around the same latitude as the middle of Italy and um, uh, Rome in particular. And you can, of course, these are loaded comparisons or equivalences that, uh, that involve, that sort of incorporate the entire um, uh, tradition of Western history into this new place, New England, new in the 17th and 18th century for Europeans, um, there's a conscious or implied uh, attempt to integrate not only the climatic, pretend, you know, supposed similarities between these places, but also the sort of the cultural um, associations with them. So this is uh, from a page, a very standard kind of um, uh, chart that was included in uh, the late 18th century Samuel Morris's publication, American Geography. And in fact, it incorporates American geography just as Williams incorporates New England geography into the history of the world. Morris and others incorporate American geography into the geography of the world and uh, provides the, you know, the sort of important areas of each part of the world and their latitudinal cousins. So here we have Rome, Constantinople, the Caspian Sea and New England in the same grouping, which is an odd grouping in all but latitudinal terms, I would argue, <laughs> um, at least my, uh, the way that I, that I think of uh, the comparisons between these places. So slide, please. Okay. So from the very beginning, from you know the, the late 16th century mariners who were coming to New England, to the region, and all the way through the 17th and 18th centuries, actual descriptions by people who don't have vested interests in representing New England in latitudinal terms or in otherwise rosy, the rosy terms of, uh, that would suggest that New England somehow has a Mediterranean climate over and over again in sort of um, objective, let's say, descriptions of the region, you get um, horrified sort of um, accounts of just how bad, how severe, how harsh, uh, how long the winters are, how bad the Northwest winds uh, rip across one's um, naked face, um, the ways in which Nova Scotia itself is might as well be in the subarctic or Arctic zone, that's how frozen and cold the bays and the rivers become, um, and that there's nothing Mediterranean about these places. And the same goes for the descriptions of the summers, which are perceived to be much too hot and humid and also very short. Um, so that of course presents, um, the, uh, sorry, so those descriptions begin to circulate the mismatch between expectations based largely on these ancient models of climatic zones of the world and, um, and real experience that's recorded, uh, whether in publications about uh, the colonies or personal correspondence or the other kinds of 
text that's produced throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, this becomes an enduring stereotype of New England. Lest you think New England is a New England in terms of environmental conditions, let alone a, a New Rome, uh, we have testimony from generations of, of settlers that suggests otherwise. And that's quite a, a, a persistent and also a threatening image to, to those with, with economic interests in the region. Slide. So much so that I thought it was um, fitting that when I looked up the Lowell Institute, just to see a little bit what um, they're about, um, it, they include on their website, this quotation from John Lowell Jr., who's the founder of the Institute who bequeathed money in his will to founding this educational um, program or institution um, in which he writes, uh, the prosperity of my native land, New England, which is sterile and unproductive, has to depend on kind of intelligent citizens. Therefore, I established this lecture series. So that image of New England, the soil is as too acidic, sterile and un unproductive, also um, in, uh, engaged, you know, if you, if you read kind of more broadly uh, what's written about the region, over and over and over again, there's a lot of negative publicity about the region, so much so that by the 19th century, um, just as the South comes to, you know, be stereotypically thought of as sort of sweltering and languorous and um, threatening to, to sort of um, inhabitants' morals, uh, which of course has much to do also with the plantation regime, New England comes to have this other stereotype, which is one that's acquired over the course of decades um, and a century and a half of the colonial experience. Uh, slide. Um, so as I mentioned before, what the, the, the most, you know, the, uh, once you start to look around, whether in private papers or um, the, the personal um, correspondence between people in England and New England or across New England and, and other colonies, the um, most of the discussion about climate, even by people with scientific bent like Williams, have to do with a reaction against these kinds of stereotypes. Um, that's motivating, in other words, much of, much of early debates and discussions about climate, even though, um, as I hope I can talk about a little bit, and maybe we'll get into more in the weeds in, in question and answer as people are interested, um, um, even, even by those um, who want to understand empirically in terms of scientific evidence, what the true nature of the climate is, what's motivating many of their um, of their forays into into uh, climate science, um, if you will, in this period, is an attempt to overcome the conflicting stories about um, how to capture what really are fleeting conditions, especially in a place like New England, where the weather is very changeable. Um, so, how to get at the reality of what the climate's like. What was it like before the colonial period, if possible? What might it come to be like? Is there any is there any relationship between what's happening on the ground in places like Boston and the environmental conditions around them? These are all questions that people asked over and over and over again, um, and uh, debated with a lot of fervor um, throughout throughout the 1700s. So, as I say in my in my book, I talk about three different strands and give sort of um, uh, try to offer some colorful case studies, um, stories that fall into each of these categories, which of course I'm not going to go into um, at the moment, um, but I'll just give you a very quick overview of the first two strands and then come back to Williams's argument, which was that colonists had actually materially changed the climate as a result of their, um, uh, as a result of the ways in which they were intervening in landscape changes. So the first would be the most obvious, and I call it in a sort of cheeky way, cold climate denial. That is, there were um, attempts to simply deny that descriptions of New England or Nova Scotia as being too cold for habitation or too cold for economic development, that people should avoid it if they can, uh, were simply inflated um, falsehoods. And anyone with real experience in the region um, could tell you otherwise. And there was a particularly dramatic case that I write about in the book in which um, immigrant or deportees from Jamaica, um, former uh, African slave and uh, enslaved Africans who um, revolt against the government of Jamaica are deported to Nova Scotia in the very late 18th century. 
And um, interestingly, the governor of Nova Scotia at that time, who's a loyalist who moves from New Hampshire, John Wentworth, attempts to um, settle these Jamaicans in Nova Scotia, despite many, many racially charged um, objections to doing that. Mo many people in the British Empire wanted these deportees to leave Nova Scotia and go to another warm place where they might be more comfortable, assuming that race has something to do with one's adaptation to a climate zone, uh, tropical, temperate, or um, Arctic. Uh, and John Wentworth, Wentworth was probably one of the, the most sort of uh, um, fervent, outspoken defenders of the not cold climate of, of Nova Scotia. Uh, but there are many other instances of this and different sort of rhetorical strategies that colonial officials um, and landowners take on to, to uh, assuage fears that, that living in uh, the Northeast is um, either, you know, uh, either a bad proposition or possibly even deadly. The second kind of um, variation of response to, to ideas about climate in New England, stereotypes of climate in the Northeast, um, is to argue that any living thing that is that is broad or that migrates to the region can be acclimat acclimated acclimatized or seasoned as it was sometimes called um to the to the region so that involved either saying that yes the place can be settled um it can become prosperous um if we bring other northern or cold hardy plants animals or people from places like scandinavia northern england scotland russia to live there because they've already had experience with the cold. Um, and so it's not that the climate is too harsh for habitation for some kinds of people and other living things, it's perfectly normal. Um, and again, I offer a few kind of um, key comment histories uh, or stories uh, of, of, of that strategy um, for thinking about the climate and approaching it. Uh, Finally, and again, I think most sort of uh, surprisingly or dramatically are uh, explicit discussions about not only the possibility, but the reality that the climate itself has changed. Um, and the reason why someone like Williams uh, believes that, that such climate warming or tempering has happened over the course of the colonial period, that possibly those descriptions of early New England and Nova Scotia from the 1630s or 40s or throughout the 17th century may have been accurate, but by the time that he is living and investigating the question in the 1770s, 80s, and 90s, um, the region itself, the character of the climate in the region has changed. And so the stereotype might be based on antiquated information uh, that colonists, that European colonists, generations of farmers and land, uh, landowners, developers have um, made history the climate that's described by the 17th century settlers is not the climate that 18th century uh, settlers living in Boston um, know to be true. Uh, and why is that? Um, again, I don't want to go too much into detail because I, I'm aware of the time and of this format, which is probably bizarre for everyone, including me. But the idea is that simply transporting um, Europeans their um, agricultural companions, that is the domesticated animals, cows, pigs, horses, sheep that, they, that live alongside them, that help them to cultivate the ground, taking down forests in order to clear ground for, uh, for agricultural development, that, that this opens up the earth to the sun, uh, that it changes the wind patterns. I mean, some of this is very commonsensical. And, and over time that these changes, if, may, if the landscape is maintained, these changes will become permanent. Uh, slide. Slide. Um, now, Williams doesn't invent this idea. Not only is it very widely circulating among people um, who are his contemporaries, like Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, and many, many others who believe that there's some truth to this notion uh, that colonists might have changed the climate, they derive some of these ideas from, again, from ancient theories about the relationship between landscape changes and climate changes. Um, and that's expressed 
Hopefully you folks can hear me. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties here. We will try to work to get Anya back on as soon as we can here. Um, but pretty, really interesting talk so far. Um, and we've had a few of the questions in the chat that have come through um, so far, really, I think, focusing on these, these um, really interesting similarities that maybe we don't think about a lot or make the connections between, uh, especially these latitudinal lines of, of Boston going maybe through Rome, maybe going through, through Istanbul and the thought that these, um, these, because of the latitude, these areas are going to have similar weather patterns or even the, the similar developmental patterns because of where they are. Um, a couple of the questions that we've had so far that, that hopefully um, we can get um, Anya to, to talk through a little bit are precisely to this question. I think if we're thinking about the American Revolution itself, what are some of the, the central features ideologically of the revolution? And there's been a lot of work on that, of course, a lot of famous scholarship from the, the 60s, 70s that, that still resonates in, in some ways to the period uh, that, that we're talking about now for ourselves in terms of, of how the history is written, but this question of um, republicanism going back to uh, the early forms of government in Rome, in ancient Greece. And I think this is a really important question then to um, try to develop and um, try to work through in, in terms of, okay, well, if the climate is indeed changing, if we as 18th century Bostonians, um, folks in, in New England, if through our industry and work, we can make this climate closer to um, closer to what we know exists in places like Rome and in places like uh, Const Constantinople, uh, then Istanbul now, uh, the Caspian Sea, to, to what level um, might we be able to further or even better replicate those political institutions that, were, that we are trying to mimic, uh, replicate? Um, in many cases, um, I think the thought would be actually improve upon these, these models of, of ancient Rome and ancient, um, ancient Athens. So I think that's a really uh, compelling um, avenue that, uh, that, uh, that Anya's um, you know, talk has, has, has put out here. Um, so certainly it's something that, that I think we'd like to, to explore a little bit more with her when we can. Uh, when we can get her back here in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, I think the uh, other big question here, which is kind of, you know, connected to that to some extent is, is what's for somebody like Williams, um, how much are his arguments and um, the ways in which uh, he's pushing for, uh, for, for industry and, um, and work amongst you know, Bostonians and New Englanders, how much is that uh, a push for improving the climate? How much is this an, an environmental argument? Or how much is this a um, almost a, a, a social control as, as the revolution's being sorted as um, the, the country's being founded in that period of the 1770s? So it uh, looks like we have Anya. This is yeah. something that never happens in face-to-face <laughs> well, none of the, <laughs> the PowerPoint would have. So I, um, I'm so sorry about that. I was just, I was kicked off and couldn't, and couldn't come back on. Um, right. Yeah. I wonder if we should, if I should just say a couple of words in summary and then refer back to slides to go in, into greater details. Sure. Yeah, that, that would definitely work. Yeah. If you want to maybe um, pull it together here, one of the things that I was talking about in the last couple of minutes, and I, we've already had a few questions on this in particular, right. kind of these Roman, um, you know, the, the, this thread of the nation being formed at this particular moment, some of these, these, you know, these connections to antiquity. So we can maybe return to some of those questions too in, in just a bit. Okay. So we can, yeah, we can yeah. toss it, toss it back to you here and I'll, I'll, I'll dip out for a minute and then I'll be back, uh, back on to okay. work through some, some questions. Yeah. So, I mean, in a, in a sense, I was rushing forward to, to, to 
giving a lot more detail and even then kind of uh, to some extent not enough to explain some of the both, again, ancient um, and contemporary theories that were informing uh, scientific ideas, to some extent Christian biblical, but also especially 18th century enlightenment scientific approaches to um, to these uh, you know, impressions, basically anecdotal impressions or observations that, or hunches that the weather had become milder as a result of the, the influx of uh, supposedly a civilizing force of, of colonists. Um, and I'd be happy to actually talk about the, the, the substance of those theories, again, because this platform is, is, is a bit um, dissolute <laughs> being on many different platforms at once and online. I'm not sure it would it, it makes sense to go into those details now that we've lost the time to the to the, to the lost to the lost connection. I will say that um, it's I think it's worth uh, at least appreciating that 18th century naturalists like Williams were not um, either cranks or um, disingenuous in their attempt to find what we might call actual scientific or hard empirical data to substantiate their theories. And that's one of the differences. I was about, just as I got cut off, had, a, had a, a slide of text taken from an early 17th century text that was looking ahead to the time that New England, though found in the same latitude as the north of Spain and the south of France, um, appears not to have the exact same climate as that or of Rome. Um, once we bring enough settlers from Europe, especially, you know, from the British Isles or elsewhere, who are willing to farm the region and make it look a lot more like, that is to make it an, a new England, a new Europe, um, if managed by industrious hands, thanks Robert, um, in, the, in the near future, it was expressed the hope from 1638 that the climate would change, that the environment would change, it would become as temperate as these other more familiar regions in, um, in the Eastern Hemisphere. Um, but by the 18th century, what you see is uh, people associated with the nascent kind of colleges um, or, or scientific kind of curricula that are developing in the in the otherwise, you know, the divinity schools of Harvard, Dartmouth, Yale, um, what comes to be Princeton and um, and Columbia, the, these early um, colleges or universities in, in the Americas, as well as institutions, like I mentioned, like the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and agricultural societies, and even sort of so-called um, agricultural and mechanical societies or institutes like the one by the late 18th or early 19th century, like the one that becomes the Lowell Institute, um, that many of the people who know a bit or tinker in chemistry, um, in, in um, what we would now consider to be physics or geology or geo early geosciences by a different name, botany, geography, and so on, all the different sciences connected to natural history or natural philosophy, that they are trying to find ways to account for what they perceive to be actual climate warming. What I also wanted to talk about, um, and again, I can answer, I could go into that if, if people are interested. Um, but what I also wanted to mention was that there are vigorous debates, not just about the methods used, like how do you substantiate or do you rely on ancient wisdom, Ptolemy, uh, and Galen and other ancient writers, do you, or you know, do you rely, rely on biblical scripture? Do you contradict biblical scripture? But also using the methods of science that are at hand in the 18th century, is there actual global warming or regional warming contributing to a broader you know warming in the earth uh, or not? Um, and another part of this debate is whether or not the world is actually con continuing to cool which some argue it has been doing since the dawn of time, since the beginning of earth history. Um, so there are so many variants of the debates about climate change uh, that particularly in this format um, are a bit difficult to summarize. But what what's fa was fascinating to me in writing this book and really continues to be um, intriguing, I think, and important in thinking about, well, to what extent is this relevant in, the, in our moment when discussions about global climate change are real, pressing, and um, very well substantiated, um, despite contrarian uh, attempts to, 
to um, dislodge scientific consensus about it, is that um, there's a much, I would argue, given, given the, the large scope and the ambition of discussions and, and disagreements about climate and climate change in as early as the 1600s and 1700s, um, many of the ideas, some of them very clearly and others kind of take a little bit more time to unravel um, over the course of a book uh, or more, have persisted. They persisted into the 19th century, the idea that the rain, that rain would follow the plow. That's something that you hear um, told to pioneers in the 19th century, as well as in the 20th century, um, dust in the Dust Bowl, that where you cultivate, you know, you will bring better, kind of more um, conducive conditions for, for economic prosperity. Um, ideas about latitude and climate persist. Certainly the kinds of ideas that I write about in the book and only briefly mentioned here about the, the relationship between certain kinds of people, especially supposed racial categories of people and certain kinds of climate and the characteristics of each, that there is some connection between them. People who inhabit and are sort of from tropical climates as opposed to people who inhabit um, and are characteristic of Northern climates that we've inherited in some a, a very rich culture of ideas about climate um, that transcend the polarized debates uh, in which you know it's very easy to get caught up in and important to pay attention to when we're talking about anthropogenic climate change in the present. But taking a historical perspective and realizing just how old some of, some aspects or how different and, and longstanding some of the aspects of our current discussions are, um, allows us to see that, uh, at, I think allows us to see that, that um, the scientific approaches have become much more sophisticated to use, an, you know, to, to, which is an understatement um, over the course of the 20th and 21st centuries to, to assess whether or not shifts are actually occurring seasonally or over longer cycles. However, the kind of the engagement with climate as a phenomenon is not fleeting or new, and many of the stakes and the political undertones of um, of those debates also have a long uh, a long heritage and 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 um, and tradition that might in, that might allow us to get somewhat beyond um, the polemics of of contemporary debates, or at least that's what it, it allowed me to do um, as someone who wrote a book about the topic. So again, apologies for uh, <laughs> apologies for all of the technical glitches, um, and I'm happy to answer a question, any questions that that might have come up. All right, great, thank you so much, Anya. That was that was uh, terrific, and I, I think we actually do have um, some kind of crossover between some of the questions that are that are coming in so far. Um, so one of the things that I was I was talking. Um, uh, uh, Bit about, and I think we're just getting a question in on this right now. Is um, this this question of antiquity and 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 Rome, and um, you know, drawing that line through Constantinople and and Istanbul? Um, is this with with you know more temperate climates, or with uh, perceived changes or, or hopeful changes in the 18th century? I mean, is this a goal that um, people are talking about? Maybe even politically, I'm thinking about. Um, obviously, some of the the republicanism and some of the some of the you know language used around the revolution is there a goal to try to be more Roman in a sense, or be more like antiquity, meshed in with with these questions of climate too? Uh, so yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think one of uh, well, one of the things that I did in the book was try to show the kind of the longer. Um, Longer trajectory of, of those ideals, so they weren't they were certainly energized by uh, the republican rhetoric and revolutionary rhetoric of the 1770s, 80s, and kind of and and into the to the early national period um, in the late 18th and early 19th century. I think they were uh, there were so many attempts to try to reengage uh, well republican rhetoric, but other ideals of of um, of uh, Roman government, uh, political ideals, that the resonance is much greater. Um, however, I think what happens in the 18th century from a different perspective, which is one, some, as someone trained as a historian of science, that's kind of what I 
have been was most alert to and was inter partly interested in making the connection between those political discussions and scientific discussions is that generally speaking in the 1770s, 80s and 90s, um, print culture just explodes. And that has an effect on what isn't science as we come to know it in the later 19th and 20th century, but but includes you know discussions that we would classify as science, including discussions about climate. Um, institutions for science kind of encouragements to, to for citizens uh you know to go and collect specimens and all this kind of um activity ha uh in, explodes or blossoms around the same time as the american revolution maybe not coincidentally right um so that it's it, in some ways um of course there are political implications to it but a they they have much long longer roots as i you know, try to suggest that they go back to, at least in colonial America, in a place like Boston, to the early 17th century. That has to, you know, maybe to do with a, 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 a interest in smaller republicanism, but but have more to do with the preoccupations of colonists over a longer period of time, and that that becomes um, emphasized in a new way, um, in a big, much bigger new way, because of what's happening intentions in the empire between the colonists and and um how closely tied discussions about climate which harken back to ancient ideas have to do with the revolution the politics of the revolution per se rather than another aspect of longer standing discussions that earlier had nothing to do right right with those tensions. right so we have we have another one coming in here um which um I think is interesting. I think a lot, maybe at least the the wording around it is probably on a lot of people's minds. And I, I, I notice you haven't used the phrase, which you know gets tossed around a lot, the mini ice age for this period. So this question here, I understand there was a mini ice age going on during the period, could have accounted for some of the early freezing. Uh, could the climate have been changing without our influence? A lot of deforestation was already going on through the 17th and 18th. Um, and could that and the amount of wood being burned for warmth, let alone shipbuilding, already have had that much impact? Yeah. So, right. Mini Ice Age, or I assume what the question is, that it's usually called the Little Ice Age, all right. you know, initial capitals, Little Ice Age, which um, at in this, it, uh, so for those who don't, who haven't heard this term, um, was identified, it, was it wasn't an actual Ice Age, but it was a relative cooling cycle in um, in the world's climate, mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, um, between roughly the 14th century, the middle of the 14th century, the middle 1350s, and roughly the middle of the 19th century, which um, much much climate science, contemporary climate science, and the you know to us current climate science has shown and continues to investigate the effects that a slight dip in temperatures, like a couple of degrees Celsius lower, um, it, it, it crossed this long period the, between the 14th and the 19th centuries, the, the many, the manifold effects it had, environmental effects it had on things like sea ice, uh, on yeah, forest cover, uh, plant cycles of all kinds, succession, um, and how that, because it coincides of course with um, with colonization, European conquest and colonization of the Americas, what effect it might have had on relationships between uh, native people and um, conquerors, what effects it might have had on kind of settlement patterns, on you name it. And a huge part, I should say, of climate history, um, which is not what I do really, but uh, of climate history of historians who are interested in climate, collaborating with scientists, who um, are producing these kinds of studies of like tree ring data, for example, or ice core samples from the Arctic or subarctic, uh, try to do is collaborate and try to get a very fine grained understanding of how well known events like the Revolutionary War, or like the settlement of, um, you know, Plymouth Plantation, um, were shaped by the fact that winters were longer, they were more severe, we know that now, of course, at the time, Nobody had this long range perspective. Um, but one of the questions going in, and it, I, it, I use it as, a, as a, a question to launch the book as well in my introduction to the book, is 
given that we know now that there was this so-called little ice age, of course, there are debates about exactly when and when it, it, right. when it began and ended and just how significant it, its effects were now among historians and scientists. But let's just accept that there was a cooling period. Um, why is it that people like Williams, who even you know in the 18th century, there are very severe years that are affected by the cycles of the little ice age, why is it that you know over the course of decades and centuries colonists are talking about warming? And when I said Thomas Jefferson and Franklin, I mean if you read notes on the state of Virginia, he talks about exactly the kind of climate tempering that Williams talks about for New England. So that was a looming question over the book. Um, and as I, I, you know, my argument, of course, is that cultural um, baggage, <laughs> I guess, um, is hard to shed. Uh, right. And so, all you know, whenever we're talking about discussions of climate, even if we believe, as I hope most of our listeners um, <laughs> believe, that climate change now, global warming, um, and other anomalies are present since at least, you know, uh, let's say World War II, if not before, um, if not since the Industrial Revolution, are real. Uh, nevertheless, even even that science is inflected necessarily by by our understandings of the relationships be, you know between ourselves in society between societies between the you know by the political debates that frame um, our ways of thinking about um, economic development and the other sorts of terms that, that I use to talk about the 17th and 18th centuries so um, the paradox I guess I, I begin the book with is that even though we know the climate was relatively cooler over the course of those 150 years that Williams talks about, um, he and many others, with the best evidence they had at hand at the time, saw the opposite trends, mm -hmm. um, and that's the and that's the puzzle that I that I kind of try to tease apart. I will say that based from other what what I came to learn after I wrote the book, um, and it's in that article that you mentioned, Robert, about um, the Arctic. Um, is that by the late 18th century, in this you know newly vigorous transatlantic scientific culture, where more and more people are getting involved and corresponding with one another of, about you know botany and climate and geology and all these things, um, there were theories about global cooling that seemed to be borne out in the experience of whalers in the Arctic that sea ice was forming, uh, that was you know the extent of sea ice was greater in the late 18th century that harvests were um, being stunted by colder winters, especially in, in England. And so there was a kind of theorizing about uh, what we might think of as a, as a little ice age, even if the scope of it in their understanding in the late 18th century was not as big as we've come to, come to understand. Mm -hmm. So I think we have time for, for a couple more here, maybe, maybe. But, but we have a question on um, maybe looking at the 17th century more, but what kind of industrious management did people think that they could do to affect climate? Uh, good farming can make land more productive, but how could they improve the climate? So I think in, in practical terms, what are what were some of the things that they were thinking, or those that, that subscribe to this idea, what can we do to improve and affect climate? So one of the kind of key terms in the book, but also of the of the colonial period of the 17th and 18th centuries that gets trotted around a lot is this word improvement, which is is, is embedded in that question. Um, in the 18th century, the word improvement was some, some near equivalent to it is what we call development, um, economic development or resource exploitation and development. So, but improvement is, and improvement like development is a sort of a loaded term that, that suggests that whatever you do with natural resources, you're, it's progressive. It's making right. things better, uh, at least for someone uh, or something. So improvement in the 18th century could encompass a whole lot of things, but it began and it most closely was associated with agricultural improvement um, or agricultural development. So again, yes, in the question, could industrious management, uh, could farm it, farming could like make the land more productive, but how could it improve the climate? So in pragmatic terms, um, first of all, because there was this um, image misperception um, of colonists, by colonists, in, especially by, or, you know, uh, 
I should say of Europeans, especially those Europeans who had never actually come to the shores of the of, of North America or elsewhere, was that native territories were mostly, you know, primeval forests and were undeveloped entirely because of course there was the um the cultural bias uh that native peoples um didn't do much to develop to, to develop land at all to change their environments that they inhabited their environments whether it's a negative or a positive stereotype you know they worked with nature or they simply kind of were subsumed within nature um, and so the idea was that colonists had to come and make the landscape resemble the kind of um, uh, the kind of environment that that they could uh, that they could live in and they could um, make a connection across the Atlantic to civilized places. So that meant clearing land. So deforestation is at the at the basis of these ideas about improving the land. Even before you get to farming, it's uh, taking down forests and the the one of the the pra practical you know results of of um, deforestation is obviously a uh, um, not a very nice term, but of converting forests into arable land, uh, I guess, is that you would drain what was found throughout New England. And of course, ironically, in the late 20th century, it starts to become reversed. You find a lot of swampy, waterlogged lands, um, especially in the coasts where um, riverine coasts and sea coasts, where colonists first come to. Um, and so draining land and, and turning it into, into uh, farmable soil uh, creates somewhat less humid conditions. Uh, it, as I mentioned, it exposes the, the ground uh, to the air. So um, it, it's easier to turn, um, it's the, the sun hits it, uh, it's easier to cultivate um, crops. Uh, and, um, and it allows um, other kinds of changes, especially in a place like New England, the snow cover is more extensive. And so you're able to have not only arable lands in terms of um, turning up more, uh, turning more ground into soil, but also in terms of um, essentially irrigating it through this seasonal shift of, of um, exposing more of this, uh, uh, allowing uh, snow cover to, to melt into the earth. Um, so in some ways, you would, it, it's very kind of um, basic. It's, it's not very impressive, <laughs> the, this aspect of the theory, but the idea is that it's such a dramatic change that colonists have implemented in more and more expanding regions. And what's notable about it, again, is that if you start looking at other regions, like anyone writing about Virginia or South Carolina, and to some extent, the, tropic, the tropical colonies in, in the Caribbean, although somewhat less so, interestingly, uh, local elites will say the exact same thing, that improvement is making these kinds of climatic changes. In places that are too hot, it's also becoming more temperate, even though it's a reversal of what's happening in, in, in or it's the inverse of what's happening in the North. Um, but, but you know, you, you won't be stunned to learn what, what the kind of succession theory, I guess, is of, of why pragmatically the climate is changing. That's why what's more exciting, I guess, about it are the cultural ideas about why it is that only certain kinds of people carrying certain kinds of civilizational um, technologies and and um, capabilities are able to create these climatic changes that other sorts of people simply can't. Um, so that the colonists, in a sense, are doing a service to native peoples. Mm -hmm. They're turning the land into land that can be can be um, used for uh, all you know a whole range of new vegetables, animals, you know, uses that would never have, uh, never have appeared otherwise. Right. And that ha then has uh, consequences for the climate. So we're almost out of time. I think maybe one time for one last question here. And off of that point, I, I, I am curious to know with these sorts of local elites that, that you're, you reference both here and in, in your book and with some of these theories prevailing, how much or how little are say oral tradition traditions and oral histories from native peoples that you know these individuals that you're writing about are interacting with how much do oral traditions and histories come into play in, ter in terms of kind of long-term climate or are they rejected or, or set aside through the period that you're talking about yeah that's an excellent question and that is a huge um caveat that the book or or the book does not address that partly because the kinds of um sources that i use um 
I guess you would say sim- either simply uninterested or or um, interested in or, or be- believe that Native people ha- have much to contribute to discussions about climate or else their purposeful silencing of of um, oral traditions among among the kinds of Native um, groups that are in constant contact with colonists through, as we know, through the late 18th and 19th century. I did, in Nova Scotia, one of the naturalists who I write about, um, uh, who, who contributes to discussions about climate and other aspects of natural history, does um, at least recorded um, some oral traditions from uh, Mi'kmaq ideas about climate, but they're not particularly historical. They're contemporary with um, with the man in the, in the late 18th and early 19th century. Um, I think, you know, the kinds of oral, the kinds of oral histories that are gathered from all across the colonies by Williams, or by, by um, travelers who, who visit colonies almost always rely on colonial, um, on, on colonial testimony, on the testimony of European settlers. But that is a project that, um, that other historians have taken up um, using, you know, somewhat different methods than I did, than I did in my book. But, um, but, uh, that one way of answering that question is that that is mainly work left to be done. What I think is very difficult to show is the connection between the explicitly scientific understandings of the 18th century and interest in sort of, uh, local knowledge by a whole range of people who don't qualify as learned, learned elites like that, that, that connection is very difficult to make. Um, but, uh, but Tom Wickman at Trinity college in Connecticut, uh, in Connecticut has, uh, has a terrific book about mainly the 17th century in new England that tries to address these questions. And I believe, Joyce Chaplin is working on a book that looks at almanacs as evidence for 18th century, mostly I think, but maybe 17th, 18th century understandings of climate change that is also going to incorporate sort of um, uh, other perspectives than those that, that made it into my book. But it's an excellent question and it's certainly not something that I was able to address. Great. And and we are running out of time here. We just had one last one, too, that kind of fuses into this, but thinking about theology, right, as, a, as another component about this. So obviously a very strong influence on the particular region that we're talking about here in the 17th century. But maybe just a, a final word and then we'll wrap up here on on the uses or non-uses of, of theological arguments and sermons to kind of push 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 ideas of improvement linked into uh, temperate climate. Right. Well, the, the, the image of, you know, um, of Eden or, or returning to a garden um, is, is, is very much part of the, the tempered ideal and, and part of the sort of Christian or theological or I might even say spiritual aspect of the ideology of improvement. Um, uh, and it's embedded in things like, you know, the Connecticut seal. Uh, which has a, a um, image of a vineyard um, on it um, and a native person, uh, you know, sort of juxtaposed. Uh, uh, what's interesting, and if you're to get into the weeds of some of the scientific theories, is that William Samuel Williams, I, I uh, mentioned, was a minister, and he ministered in Bradford, Mass, before he became a, um, a professor of math and the sciences at Harvard, most of the people, um, with the exception of some like Jefferson or Franklin, most of the people I write about, many of them anyway, were um, ministers and almost all of them, or well, let's just say all of them are, um, are, are, uh, faithful Christians. Um, there's not much, you know, so, uh, the theories about climate change are in some ways, the scientific theories are at odds with biblical scripture, particularly of um, Exodus and descriptions of the th- flood and the ways in which by the 18th, 17th and 18th century, um, people are counting how many millennia um, there are in the history of the earth. So the histories of the earth that, that in- deeply inform ideas about climate and climate change in the 18th century suggest by degrees of magnitude, much many, many more, you know, millennia than than otherwise um, you, you can be found in the Bible. And so there's a very productive tension, I think, um, between uh, between 
what the Bible tells us, um, maybe not the climate, but the the landscape of the world was in the in the distant past and the ways in which the landscape in those places in the ancient, you know, the ancient versus the contemporary Mediterranean or Near East look like uh, that contributes to a sort of massaged version of something between theology and um, scientific empiricism in the in the 18th century. Um, you know, there's no if there's one thing you can say, which I, I wouldn't say about contemporary climate science, um, but if there's one thing you can say, and I find it you know, particularly interesting for this reason to study the 18th century, um, people aren't that concerned about consistency <laughs> in, their, in, in these views or, else, or, or, or in another way they can think about different kinds of proximate and ultimate causes for the phenomena they see in, you know, in their daily lives. Um, and so, for example, Williams never, almost never addresses the theological contradictions that must have troubled him uh, about his ideas about, about climate change. Um, that's only a partial answer to that question, but obviously we are out of time. So, um, <laughs> and, and it's such a rich, uh, that was terrific though. I mean, that's, there's so much depth to that question too, um, just thinking about the different even developmental patterns of the, the area that you're talking about here with, with theology as well. So that was terrific. And, and thank you so much, uh, Anya, for, for this talk. And I think you've really you know, resonated with a lot of our audience here. And this was a, a terrific um, kickoff to the, the uh, 2020 little lecture series. Well, thanks to you again. And thanks for bearing in one way or another with the, 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 <laughs> the, the glitches. Um, so <laughs> yeah, and thank all of you very much for coming out tonight. We we do really appreciate you watching, you tuning in from wherever you are in the in the country and, and world. Uh, do let us know if you have any further questions. We're always available by email as well, and we do hope that you'll come back uh, next week and the week after. We do have two more lectures coming up. So next Tuesday, uh, it'll be the same place, same time, six thirty p.m. Uh, Eastern time, we might add too, because I know people are coming from all over the country as well. Uh, next week's talk, we're moving more into the 19th century. So it's entitled Frozen Over, Boston's 19th Century Ice Age by Andrew Robichaud. He's a professor at Boston University, so local here, talking about not just um, climate in the 19th century, but utilizations and kind of the commodification of ice itself over that century. So we're moving into the 19th century, and then we'll be moving a little bit more closer to where we are now in that final final lecture as well. Uh, before we close, we'd like to thank again um, our partners, Revolutionary Spaces, Boston Green Ribbon Commission, and of course the Lowell Institute for, for making this possible. And do you and have I, a, a word there? I just wanted to mention that if, if anybody wanted to contact me with questions, um, I could entertain those by, by email and you can find my um, faculty page on the Concordia History Department website. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much for that, Anya. Um, and thank you again for the talk and thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, we will sign off for now and hope to see you back here next week.